Greetings and welcome to Antenna Briefs number 4A. If you've already seen episode 4, this is an errata or a list of corrections to that. Now, what does all that mean uh, if you haven't seen episode 4? Well, in episode 4, we looked at a solution to a homework problem that was assigned in episode 3. Specifically, could we communicate using our current technology with a civilization or maybe one of our own probes uh, that is out at the TRAPPIST-1 solar system? And if so, at what bandwidth? That effectively controls how fast we can send data. Or, if we're doing a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the bandwidth requirement controls how long we have to sit on each frequency that we look at. And before we had gotten 0.004 hertz, which meant we needed to sit there for like 250 seconds on each frequency. Uh, now it works out to be 0.4, which is closer to what people are using in SETI. So maybe if there is a civilization in the TRAPPIST-1 star system and they happen to be pointing directly at Earth and we happen to be pointing directly at them and they're just sending a nice constant single frequency, maybe we could receive them. So the calculations we're doing are assuming that we have 70 meter diameter dishes at each end of the link. This is one of the largest steerable dishes that we have on the planet Earth. There are slightly larger ones, the Arecibo Observatory, uh, which unfortunately now is defunct, but there's also now a 500 meter diameter um, radio telescope of which 200 to 300 meters is about the usable area there, and it's limited to a maximum frequency of 3 gigahertz. So we're just going to stick with an assumption of 70 meter dishes at each end of the link, and we can scale the results and figure out what would happen if we had a bigger one. We're also going to assume a transmit power of 1 kilowatt, which is our current technology limit at this kind of frequency, and a noise temperature of 20 Kelvin and a signal-to-noise ratio needed of 10. And for more background on that, of course, uh, see episode 3 in the series. However, we'll do a quick review here. Here's the setup. We have a transmitter on the left and a receiver on the right. The transmitter has a power that goes into the antenna of PT. And we're interested in how much power is received some distance D away. That power needs to be bigger than the noise power. And in episode 3, we said the received power is the power density in watts per square meter, or more likely uh, atto watts per square meter, or something really small. Um, anyway, times the area of the receive antenna. So we can see that the larger the area of the receive antenna, the more received power we get. The other major factors are shown in the power density calculation, which is the transmit power times what's called the directivity gain of the transmit antenna, divided by the surface area of the sphere that surrounds the transmitter and is of radius d. Now, the area of the dish is just the uh, radius squared times pi, or diameter divided by 2 squared times pi. So that's this factor. The Transmit antenna gain is due to the focusing of the energy in a very particular direction by this parabola. And here's the formula for that. And this is where the number crunching before went wrong. I probably entered the lambda value wrong. So here's the overall formula we use for finding the received power. And we need to make sure that power is larger than noise, which is given by this equation. And here is the solution to the homework number one, the revised solution. The items that were off before are circled in red. And as we said, uh, the transmit antenna gain was incorrectly computed as 5.5 times 10 to the 6. This is the correct value. And that means that the received power is actually a factor of 100 stronger than we had before. Anyway, this is the received power now. And it is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 21 watts or in dBm, minus 179 dBm. The noise power that this received signal needs to be stronger than is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 22 watts, and that's minus 186 dBm. So the received signal is actually stronger than the noise by about 6 dB, or a factor of 4.3 in power. 
So these calculations were based on the given data, and we just tried a bandwidth of 1 hertz. We could, of course, done some algebra and solve this to just directly compute the bandwidth that we need. But I chose to just try 1 hertz, and then I like to scale stuff. So we'll see how far off we are. Well, we needed a signal-to-noise ratio of 10. We had 4.3, so we need to modify the result by a factor of 2.3. So essentially that means instead of 1 hertz, we need to be 1 over 2.3, or about 0.4 hertz bandwidth. And that's for TRAPPIST-1, which is 39.5 light years away, which is about 3.7 times 10 to the 17th meters. It's very far away in both distance uh, and time. So it takes almost 40 years for a signal from Earth to reach there, and then if they were to send a signal back, it would take another 40 years. So we're talking about 80 years to make a round trip call. So the implications for SETI are kind of obvious there. We're not going to have any conversations, at least within a human lifetime. Also, if you're into radio hardware design, you may recognize that 0.4 hertz at an operating frequency of 32 gigahertz is kind of hard to achieve. That requires an oscillator stability of 1 times 10 to the minus 11th. This is the corrected value before we had 1 times 10 to the minus 13th, which we could get with a GPS-disciplined local oscillator, but it was hard. Uh, now it's a little bit easier. We could probably do that with a chip scale atomic clock. But, as we said in the previous episode, episode 4, 32 gigahertz is not the right frequency for SETI anyway. Well, nobody knows what the right frequency for SETI is. We don't know what frequency ET is transmitting on. However, we do make assumptions. And traditionally, people have assumed that ET might transmit on 1.42 gigahertz because that's the neutral line hydrogen frequency. So if ET is using 1.42 gigahertz, what changes? Well, the transmit antenna gain changes because lambda changes, the wavelength changes. So that affects strongly the antenna gain. So here's where we're at. In the homework, we got the signal to noise ratio was 4.3 when we tried 1 hertz with 70 meter dishes at each end of the length. To get a signal to noise ratio of 10, we would need to modify the bandwidth uh, from the 1 hertz assumption down to 0.4 hertz. But now we're assuming that we also need to change the frequency down to a lower frequency. And if you work out the formulas, that means we need about 500 times more power, or a 500 times bigger GT, antenna gain value. Because remember, PT and GT multiply each other. So what are ET's options? Well, ET can either increase the power from the 1 kilowatt in the problem to 1.2 megawatts, still using a 70 meter dish, or increase the transmit antenna size to make up for the change in frequency. But that would have to increase to 2.3 kilometer diameter. So you can see that we're starting to put some pretty big assumptions on what ET is going to do. So what does all this mean for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, it means if we're listening at 1.42 gigahertz with a 70 meter diameter dish on our end, ET would have to transmit 1.2 megawatts. And ET would need to be pointed at Earth with an accuracy of 0.15 degrees. So they need to specifically be pointing at us, perhaps because they've monitored our planet and decided that our atmosphere has changed and we must be burning lots of fossil fuels. I don't know. Anyway, they would have to be pointing at us. Or if they wanted to omnidirectionally broadcast, just send out in all directions, they would have to increase their transmit power from 1.2 megawatts to 500 gigawatts. That is about half of the United States grid power right now. So it's doable, but it's a big, I guess, expense in a way for ET to do this. And they don't know when we're listening, so they'd need to transmit for years or decades because they don't know when we turned our radio on. So all of this is a pretty big ask, I think. And the question is, why would they do all of this? And that's a question that the SETI community has been grappling with for a long time. 
And my paraphrase of the answer is that maybe E.T. has what I call emotional intelligence also. Not just raw smarts, but perhaps they have a desire to be helpful or nice because they figured out that that's the way that we all grow better. So for discussion of that and other possibilities, uh, you might want to look at this video that I found recently and an associated book that's shown over here on the right. Now, I have no affiliation with this author, Keith Cooper, but I did watch this video from the Royal Institution, and it's titled, Why Have We Not Found Any Aliens? Or at least no repeatable signals have been found. And some of the answers are contained in what we went through today. And so the search goes on. We still point at the sky and hope we can receive some signals someday. So, thank you again for watching. If you already saw episode 4, I'm uh, sorry about the boo-boo there. And if you hadn't already seen episode 4, I hope this episode was useful. As always, if you have questions or comments, please leave them below. Thanks.